Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. And today we welcome back to the podcast Matt Zolinski. He's Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of San Diego, a co-director of USD's Institute for Law and Philosophy, and the founder of the Bleeding Hearts Libertarians blog. Today we're going to be talking about an essay by Lysander Spooner. It's a long essay called A Letter to Grover Cleveland on – here, I'll read the full title. It is A Letter to Grover Cleveland on His False Inaugural Address, The Usurpations and Crimes of Lawmakers and Judges and the Consequent Poverty, Ignorance and Servitude of the People, which gives a good sense that's of pretty good. style. Yeah, that's good. Um, it was written in 1886. So I, I mean – let me just start with the very beginning of this, just the, the opening passage to give the tone of the essay before we move into discussing it because Spooner has a style all his own. Um, so this is – I mean as the title says, he, he's writing this letter to President Grover Cleveland. Um, so he begins by saying, your inaugural address is probably as honest, sensible and consistent a one as that of any president within the last 50 years or perhaps as any since the foundation of the government. If therefore it is false, absurd, self-contradictory and ridiculous, it is not as I think because you are personally less honest, sensible or consistent than your predecessors but because the government itself, according to your own description of it and according to the practical administration of it for nearly a hundred years, is an utterly and palpably false, absurd and criminal one. Such praises as you bestow upon it are therefore necessarily false, absurd and ridiculous. <laughs> and then it goes on for 130 pages like that. It's pretty much – yeah, it goes on. I, I, I read it. I was telling this to Matt. I, I read it in a Keith Olbermann voice. That's what I decided. It's like – and now with the countdown. So Matt – who was this guy? So Lysander Spooner was uh, – he was a cranky old man by the time he was writing this. So this was uh, this was actually written in, in 1885 and uh, uh, published in 1886. Uh, it was his last published work. Uh, he died in uh, 1887. Uh, Lysander Spooner was a uh, – he was an American uh, 19th century um, lawyer, uh, abolitionist and uh, probably one of the most important – 19th century libertarian theorists. Um, a lot of his work was – especially early in his career uh, was, was heavily focused on the law uh, given his background. So uh, probably his most famous work and one of his earliest works was an 1845 essay uh, called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. Uh, where Spooner kind of brought together his uh, his libertarianism, his belief in natural law, uh, and his concern for the Constitution to make a concerted argument that uh, that slavery, as existed in the United States, was in fact unconstitutional. Uh, that that turned out to be a profoundly influential uh, argument among a certain wing of the abolitionist uh, movement and um, and even those abolitionists who, who disagreed with them, I mean, people like Garrison who thought that um, slavery was constitutional and, and therefore so much the worse for the constitution um, had to engage with Spooner on this. So it was, it was a major, uh, major work. Um, he authored a number of other lesser known pieces throughout his life too. Um, he had uh, an essay on trial by jury. Uh, where he makes a case for what we would now uh, describe as jury nullification, um, which which had some influence. Uh, he wrote a uh, a long essay on intellectual property. Um, so Spooner is one of the best known, I guess, libertarian proponents of strong, very strong uh, rights of intellectual property. Uh, he wrote a, a series of essays uh, called No Treason, uh, which are very close in theme to the uh, letter that we're, we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and then one of my favorite things by Lysander Spooner actually is this uh, 1875 essay that he wrote called Vices Are Not Crimes, which he, uh, he published anonymously in this uh, – it was, it was a collection of essays on, uh, on prohibition. Um, in the United States, obviously not the 1920s prohibition, but earlier prohibition, um, and um, and he, it's a it's a broadly million argument, right? The idea is, look, there are certain things that uh, that people do that are that are bad, that are that are worthy of moral a kind, of, a kind of moral condemnation, but not everything that other people do that we disapprove of, even with good reason, um, ought to count as criminal. 
and therefore be subject to the kind of coercive prohibition of the law. Um, so it's it's like it's like Mill's famous essay on liberty, but it's uh, it's it's a much more hardcore um, kind of argument and and much more explicitly grounded on an idea of natural rights that I think many libertarians will find appealing. That essay is kind of interesting because it sort of disappeared off the face of the earth for about 100 years. Um, As I said, Spooner published it anonymously at first and it wasn't until uh, Benjamin Tucker wrote his obituary of Spooner in Liberty Magazine that um, that it was discovered publicly that that Spooner was the author and and then even after that it just sort of disappeared people forgot about it and uh, it wasn't rediscovered until 1977 so it's it's not in the collected works of the standard collected works of Spooner it's uh, but uh, it's pretty easy to come by now I believe on, it on the web is in Individualism a Reader published by. Libertarianism.org. Of course it is. That's an outstanding book. <laughs> Do you know if he was able to support himself through his publishing or did he work as a lawyer most of the time? He worked briefly as a lawyer. Uh, it didn't work out too well for him. Um, I, I, I feel like he would feel immoral practicing law. Yeah, I mean, he he had he had a difficult relationship with the law, and uh, and as I was telling Aaron earlier, he's he's not exactly a people person. So I, <laughs> yeah, you uh, submit a brief written like this, and you're not going to get very far. I could see him not getting on very well with uh, with clients, but uh, he he had a number of posts. He uh, he worked as a lawyer. He worked as a bank clerk for a while. Um, he he was poor throughout his life. He always had financial difficulties. Um, but uh, but as his life went on, he had uh, um, more and more occasion to support himself by his writing. Early on, I mean, one of his one of his earliest and most famous examples to uh, uh, support himself financially uh, was a company he founded in 1844 called the American Letter Mail Company, which was his own private post office uh, set up to compete with the uh, the U.S. government's post office um, in violation of of the law. This was this was legal. Prohibited, and Spooner knew it was legally prohibited. He wasn't the only one who was doing this kind of thing. Um, there were a lot of people who were sort of engaged in the private delivery of mail because postage was really, really expensive at the time. So people were resorting to things like um, sending bundles of newspapers uh, to each other and sort of s- encoding their messages in the newspapers by circling and underlying various letters because it, it turns out it's cheaper to mail like a big stack of newspapers to somebody than it is to mail a single letter. Uh, but what was unique about Spooner was the fact that he did this openly um, and, and not just in the sense that he didn't make any efforts to hide it but he actually went out of his way to publicize it. So he he wrote this essay um, called The Unconstitutionality of the Laws of Congress Prohibiting Private Males uh, which set out his argument for why in fact – um, it, it ought not be regarded as unconstitutional to set up your own private post office. And it was, a, it was a nice, simple, elegant argument. The idea was, look, if you look in the Constitution, it clearly gives the US government the power to run a post office. But it doesn't say anything about prohibiting other people from running their own post offices, right? And the delegation of a power to the government is not the same thing as delegation of power to prohibit other people from, from engaging in that same activity. So, uh, so he was begging for a fight. He sent a letter, a copy of this uh, this pamphlet to the postmaster general. He said, "Like, sue me. You know, see 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 how far this goes for you." And they never did. Um, you know, it, it, they arrested uh, some of his employees um, and and sued him. And every every single letter that was sent through his company was a separate offense. So they were really mounting up the legal bills for him. Um, and but. But by the time it looked like his case might have some legs and actually go somewhere, um, the uh, the government uh, basically conceded by lowering the postage rates um, and and sort of putting him out effectively out of business in that way. So uh, this this earned Spooner the title of father of the three cent stamp because it was the idea like he, he it's, it's his credit that uh, postage rates went as low as they did. So he the Grover letter to Grover Cleveland was not the first time he was trying to be a burr in a public official's. Uh, career. Not the first time, not the second time, not the third time. Spooner made something of a habit of this. Uh, you know, he, he started his legal career actually um, in, in agitating in this way. So Massachusetts had a law which said that um, if you were a college graduate, 
um, then you had to practice um, – you had to work with a lawyer for three years before you could set up your own practice. Whereas if you weren't a college graduate, then you had to work with a lawyer for five years. So this sort of extra burden on non-college graduates. Uh, and Spooner protested this uh, saying that this was um, uh, an illegitimate restriction and, and basically a kind of anti – uh, anti-poor, right? I mean, it's because the, you know the college and a college education in those days was kind of a luxury. It wasn't like vocational training. It was something you did if you could sort of afford um, to to spend a few years of your life not making money. Uh, and so most most people from poor and working class backgrounds uh, didn't go to college and Spooner thought this was sort of legalized discrimination against the poor, um, which is kind of an interesting theme throughout his life. I mean he's, he's a, a fierce critic of the state. Um, as we'll see in this essay, he, he, uh, he thinks that the state routinely oversteps the very narrow bounds of authority that it has and routinely does so – um, in, a, in a way that supports the interests of the strong and powerful at the expense of the poor and oppressed. So there's a real kind of left libertarian angle to Spooner's work that runs I think just throughout his career from his earliest writings all the way up to the last. I think you've said perhaps on Facebook, you've expressed your enthusiasm for this particular essay. I love this essay. Um, and so before we get into this essay, I'm curious what makes this essay better in your mind or more fun than say his more famous, the more often anthologized ones. I'm thinking of – I mean his – the No Treason essay, The Constitution of No Authority is probably the most famous. What sets this one apart from those in your mind? So I think this is um, – it's a more mature work uh, in some ways. Uh, Spooner, Spooner's thought evolved quite a bit throughout his career. Um, again, he was born in 1808, died in uh, 1887. Uh, no Treason was written I believe 1867 to 1870. This, and so this was at least 15 years later. Um, so he he'd undergone some changes through then. He's, he thought a bit more through things, and, and some of that's reflected in the text. Um, it's it's a more holistic text as well. Uh, it ties together a number of uh, of disparate themes that that run throughout Spooner's earlier work, and that aren't all in No Treason. Um, so you, you get more of the economic stuff um, in in the letter to Grover Cleveland than you would in No Treason. Um, which is nice because again, Spooner wasn't just a legal theorist. He wasn't just a philosopher. He he had really unique and, and interesting ideas in, in a wide range of disciplines. And then it's just fun. I mean, it's an angry, cranky old man. Or, you know, you can you can sort of imagine him like a, a, a listening on the radio to this address, or you know, like I imagine sort of huddled in the corner, just sort of like. Just, his face turning red uh, as he as he as he hears this, and um, and then just kind of firing off this 130 page letter in the course of a couple of hours. Uh, it's got that tone to it, and there's just some some gem quotes in here. Um, you know, whether you agree with the philosophical argument or not, I mean, they're just they're beautifully uh, expressed in a, in a way that they probably wouldn't have been if he'd if he'd taken more time to be kind of thoughtful and careful about them. Do you have any idea why Grover Cleveland or anything about was there? Did he have? Would, did Grover Cleveland disappoint him, or something? did he have high hopes for Grover Cleveland, or is there any reason that Grover Cleveland was the one to receive the blunt of his ire? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, from a libertarian perspective, it doesn't seem like there's anything more to dislike about Cleveland than um, a lot of the other presidents who were alive during Spooner's life. And Spooner uh, says that throughout. I mean, he seems to say he says at several points things that you know you're not particularly worse than anyone else. Um, you you seem to be saying the right things, but you're just either wrong or lying. Um, he, but he doesn't. He doesn't seem to have it in particularly for this guy. Yeah, I haven't read anywhere any any account of uh, what led him to write this particular essay at this particular time to, to this particular president. I mean, maybe it was just he wanted to write something and saw this as a as a kind of news hook uh, for his essay. But uh, I'd be interested in finding out if there was more to it than that. I can only speculate otherwise. Well, then let's turn to it. I mean, he. So we'll begin that. The essay is broken into a whole bunch of sections. Um, 
and a number of them seem to repeat each other. But that seemed, that's one of Spooner's styles is he's, he's rather repetitive at times. But we'll just – we'll start at the beginning. I mean the first argument that he raises as he's talking about Grover Cleveland saying that it's the, it's the role of government to create and enforce these laws. He's, he begins by saying that, that, they, that he's simply wrong about that, right? That law exists independently of government. The government has no say one way or another over what the law is. That's right. That's right. So right away in in section one of the essay, um, you basically get Spooner arguing for a kind of anarchism, right? So he's he's not soft softly starting off with uh, with his argument. Um, so Spooner Spooner was um, a, a firm believer in in natural law, and and you saw this. Earlier in his writings, you, you, it was sort of implicit in the unconstitutionality of slavery. Although, again, that that was mostly a legal argument, right? He wasn't he wasn't saying we should get rid of slavery because slavery is unjust or a violation of the natural rights of man. It was he believed that, but the argument that he was making there was it's unconstitutional. Um, Later in life, he becomes – he seems to become more radical. Um, ideas of natural law play a greater role in his arguments than idea, arguments about what the constitution does or, or does not say. Um, and so here uh, in, in this letter, he's making, he's making an argument uh, for, for what philosophers uh, would describe as a kind of philosophical anarchism. Which is, an essential, which is essentially a denial of the authority of the state um, to you – know, in other words, a, a denial of the claim that the state has the right to uh, tell you how to behave or how not to behave and that you as a citizen therefore have a corresponding obligation to obey the state's commands just, just because the state commanded them. Uh, and it's – like many of Spooner's arguments, it's it's a fairly simple and elegant argument. The idea is, look, uh, if the government comes around and passes a law, then one of two things must be the case. Either that law is uh, merely restating the natural law, right? So, so you know, maybe the natural law says that it's wrong to go around killing people, and so the the government then comes around and says, "Hey, it's don't go around killing people." Well, okay, that's true, but like you haven't added anything to my obligations as a citizen by saying that. I already had an obligation not to kill people. By virtue of the natural law, so in in that case, the law is simply superfluous. Um, on the other hand, uh, perhaps the law is not in accordance with natural law, but in violation of natural law. Um, but if that's the case, then it's it's criminal. Um, he says it's not it's not anything that we have any uh, any obligation to obey. In fact, we have an obligation to disregard it. Right? And it's sort of echoes of Augustine here. Right? An unjust law is no law at all. It's an act of usurpation. Uh, so so either the law is superfluous or it's criminal. Uh, but in neither case do we have any special obligation to do what the government tells us to do just because the government tells us to that, do it. That's the telling little phrase and. I think it's repeated a bunch of times in the first section, which is lawmakers as they call themselves. <laughs> Every time yeah. he says lawmaker, he says as they call themselves. He goes, That's they're right. just powerful people who are telling you what to do. But is that a false dichotomy? Do you think that was Spooner's dichotomy there is that is that are there laws that are neither against justice or for justice, and they just sort of describe would. Driving on the yeah. left, left side of the road, right, or right side of the road, or ba or even some basic property law laws like. How high above your property you own, or things like this, would these be neither here in neither of the category that Spooner describes? Right. So that's that's I think is exactly right. Uh, it's it, it's more complicated than Spooner uh, presents it here. Um, and not I think more complicated than he realizes. I think he knows better, but he's he's um, exercising some rhetorical liberties here. Uh, but it's it's certainly more complicated than he presents it. Right. So it's not just that either laws restate natural law or they conflict with natural law. They might um, they might add, sort of add something to natural law without merely restating it or contradicting it. So, for instance. Um, you know, you you might have a vision of natural law which says that um, you know 
part of the part of the uh, obligation of citizens is to find conventions um, to live I- I- with, amongst each other in ways that uh, facilitate peaceful coexistence, right? Um, but there could be a lot of different conventions upon which one could settle that would uh, serve that goal. Uh, and so the important thing then is just to sort of pick one of them and get everybody on the same board, like driving on the right-hand side of the road, right? Like it doesn't matter whether you drive on the right-hand side of the road or whether you drive on the left-hand side of the road. Either one one of those allows people to drive down the street without getting into head-on collisions. But it matters a lot that everybody's doing the same thing. And so um, you might think there's a role for government there in, in setting that convention um, and in a way kind of giving a certain sort of specificity to the natural law. Right? This is something um, – I mean this is something that's – fairly commonplace in the natural law tradition. You see this in Aquinas, uh, going back as far as Aquinas, right, who says that, you know, you've, you've got – the natural law could be stated at a variety of different levels of, of specificity, right? At the most general, uh, most abstract, the natural law simply says, uh, do good and avoid evil, <laughs> which is true. Uh, very that, very that, underdeterminative <laughs> though. Yes. That, that seems like a good rule but it, it doesn't really do much to settle questions about, you know, uh, uh, resolving the kinds of conflicts we face with each other in society. So, you know, you, you can you can go further than that through abstract reasoning alone, right? By reflecting on 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 scripture, if you're Aquinas, or just using your reason and thinking about the, you know, the human condition. But but even that kind of abstract reasoning will only take you so far. At some point, you need to sort of settle upon conventions that are going to pick out particular ways of of implementing these abstract rules. And that seems like um, on the natural law approach, a, a perfectly legitimate role for um, for government. If if it is somewhat reductivist, though, because I was thinking as I was reading this, I was think, thinking he, he says things unapologetically as it is clear as day to him. Things that are not clear to anyone, most other people. And if I was to say, "Oh, you want to know about libertarianism?" and I said, "Here, you should read this." And they and they would just read it, and they say this guy is a is a nut job who reduces everything down to very basic categories. And if if that is if the reduction part is somewhat true, where do we, what is the value we find in in the way that he does forcefully explain, even if they're reductivist categories? Where is the value of of the reduction there? Well, so. He's got – I mean I think there's still a basic point to that argument, right, which, which holds even once we notice that things are more complicated than he presents them, which is that um, most of us believe that there are moral standards independent of government, um, right? Most of us think that it's, it's not wrong to kill people just because government says it's wrong to kill people. Uh, and so if you take those natural laws seriously, then what, what Spooner does here is he shows us that those natural laws put a tremendous – put a very strong constraint on the legitimate scope of governmental activity. It's not maybe – it maybe goes too far to say that there's nothing at all the government can do, uh, but it certainly narrows the field, right? Um, uh, and and rules certain things out um, if if they are in conflict with these these basic moral duties. What I like about Spooner really throughout throughout this essay um, is that he he makes very vivid what seems to me to be a a key libertarian idea, which is that. The moral rules that apply to us as individuals apply to governments too. You, you don't get any special magic exemption from the rules of morality just because you and a bunch of your buddies get together and call yourself a government. You're still human beings and you're still – bound to treat the other human beings with whom you live um, in the same ways that you would be bound if if you were just a private citizen. So if it's wrong for me as a citizen to take your stuff without your consent and spend it on what I think is a really good cause, uh, then it's at least prima facie wrong for the government to do that too. Um, if you want to say that there's something special about the government um, that, that makes it OK, then there's a very – heavy burden of proof on you uh, to explain why that should be the case. So that, that's a theme that, that runs throughout Spooner's writings, um, which I think is really, really 
super important for understanding the way libertarians see the world. It's I see a lot of parallels actually between the kind of moral arguments Spooner makes in this essay and the kind of arguments that uh, that Mike Humer makes in his recent book, The Problem of Political Authority. Uh, in both cases, you have somebody who's trying to argue for very extreme conclusions, right? Humor, like Spooner, is, is an anarchist. Um, and, uh, but they try to get there by way of what they take to be fairly commonsensical moral beliefs. So they don't start off with you know, asking you to accept any crazy stuff about you know, God spoke to me last night and, right? or you know, accept, you know, accept this absolute prohibition on such and such a cavity. And then he's just saying like, look, you think it's wrong to steal from people? OK, why is it any different when it's government? Right? You think it's wrong for, for me to like uh, order you to kill somebody? Like why, you know, why do we think war is OK then? So we had humor on the podcast quite a ways back, I believe. And about a year ago, I think. Yeah, and his but his arguments <clears throat> are coming from he's a moral intuitionist. So we have these intuitions about morality and we should I mean, I'm totally yeah, not you're, being fair, you're, but you know, we should take them as somewhat yes. true. You know, they're they're true if um, our intuitions are good enough, but um Spooner doesn't seem to argue that way. I mean, he in in section 2 he basically says like, look, this these these natural rights we have, this natural law is a science. This isn't something you know. We just we don't have these free floating intuitions. There is a science of this stuff, and he then challenges Grover Cleveland, saying, you know, if there is no science of justice, how do you know that there is such principle as justice? Uh, so, I guess the question is, how does he argue for that science of justice? Because that's a little different from simply pointing to common sense moral beliefs. How does he ground this this science? Yeah, he doesn't do much. To ground it, it's mostly assertion on his part. Um, Spooner has an earlier essay um, called "Natural Law," um, which is his most sustained treatment of these more kind of meta-ethical questions about the sort of foundations of, of morality. Um, and but even there, it's a really brief essay. I think unfinished, I believe. Um, and it and it doesn't it doesn't provide what I think contemporary philosophers would regard as anything close to an adequate uh, answer to to that question. Um, my own reading of Spooner is that um, we should take his claims about the scientific nature of natural law with a grain of salt. Um, it's really I, I don't think it plays a a strong role in the in the argument. Uh, I think you know it's it's it sounds like Spooner and Humer are approaching these questions from two very different frameworks, right? So Humer is this wishy washy into and Spooner is this rigid natural lawyer. Um, but in fact, I think uh, they're, they're much more similar than they appear. Uh, I think you know, if you look into the kinds of reasons Spooner gives for believing that um, certain principles are true principles of natural law, um, it, it looks an awful lot like what humor is doing when he calls it intuitionism. Um, you know, in, in both cases, they're trying to appeal to widely shared moral beliefs. And in fact, that's kind of the argument that Spooner gives for claiming that certain principles are principles of natural law. It's like, look, every, everybody knows this, right? You just – this is common sense. Uh, it's you – know, and this is, this is a sort of common theme in natural law theory, which is that you know, the natural law is not difficult to discern. We can, we can figure out what it is. We don't have to wait for God to tell us. We can just look around the world, think about it and not even think about it all that hard uh, and we'll, we'll arrive at these, uh, these correct beliefs about what the natural law says. It struck me as interesting that in section three, we, in the first two sections, he tends to come out as full-throated anarchist as you possibly could be. And then in section three, he says, sir – that's, that's why I got the Keith Olbermann thing. Sir, if any government is to be rational, consistent and honest one, it must evidently be based on some fundamental, immutable, eternal principle such as every man may reasonably agree to and such as every man may rightfully be compelled to abide, ab abide by and obey. And if the whole power of the government must be limited to the maintenance of that single principle. So he, he then comes and says that the government does have this job, that it has to be maintaining justice. but 
doesn't it need taxation and some sort of powers over people in order to do any job that he sort of disavows in the first two sections of the of the work? Or is I mean, so is he a voluntarist? Way is that government it. though? <laughs> yeah, well, th these are these are excellent questions. Uh, Spooner uh, never described himself as a as a voluntarist. I don't believe he ever described himself as an anarchist either. Um, the position that he puts forward in this essay um, is he it clearly puts him in the realm of what we would again what we now describe in philosophy as, as philosophical anarchism, which is where you're denying that the state has any kind of special authority. But you can do that without denying that the state should exist, right? So it's, it's a philosophical anarchism is a kind of anarchism, but it's different from say the kind of anarchism that you find expressed in the writings of someone like Murray Rothbard, right? So Rothbard thinks quite explicitly uh, that not only does the state lack legitimate authority in the sense that Spooner claims. So he's he's a philosophical anarchist too. But he goes further and says that um, you know, the state is a criminal association that ought to be disbanded um, and replaced. And, and Rothbard presents us with this very robust vision of what things would look like if we did away with the state. He says we could we could provide for all our needs, all the needs that the state, the legitimate needs that the state uh, provided for us. Uh, we could provide for ourselves through voluntary combinations, through a kind of free market uh, system of defense. Spooner never really gets into any of that stuff. Uh, Spooner never talks really about abolishing the states. There are hints in this essay about defense being provided, you know, it, by voluntary means. Uh, we kind of get together and, um, you know, you protect me, I protect uh, you. But there's there's no talk of like a market um, in defense, uh, and there's no real talk really of abolishing the state. Uh, it's just, you know, the. The idea seems to be that you know it's okay for the state to exist as long as it conforms itself with the principles of natural law. But if it does that, it sort of isn't going to really be like a state anymore because um, it's only going to have the power to act as any other voluntary organization would, which it means that if it's going to raise revenue to protect your natural rights, then it has to do so with your consent and not this kind of airy-fairy consent where it's like, you know, we just assume that you consent because after all, you're still living in the territory of the United States. Um, but no, actual individual explicit consent is necessary. Uh, in order for taxation to be anything other than robbery. Uh, so it's – yeah, the state can exist but it it can exist just as a sort of private club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that too. I got the individual consent. I was – this whole essay, I was, I was trying to find where he was going. And I understand it's more of a polemic than a, it's a systematic building of a philosophy. So I think he's maybe a, you know has limited consent or allows for contractual. And then there's this part in section 7 where he says, uh, if every man, woman and child in the United States had openly signed, sealed and delivered to you and your associates a written document purporting to invest you with all the legislative, judicial and executive powers that you now exercise, they would not thereby have given you the slightest legitimate authority. Which uh, which which brings it. He talks about being able to sell yourself into slavery and whether or not you can do that and what. But it was he is talking about the powers that the government currently has. He says no one could have, no organization of people could have. I think is his point there. Yeah, yeah. So Spooner's it's interesting because he, he has a number of different arguments all leading up to the same conclusion that the state lacks legitimate authority. Right. So the, you've got that first argument that you know law is either superfluous or it's criminal. Then he backs that up with another argument, um, a kind of historical argument, right against against the social contract theorists which say that, look, the state derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. The response to that – one response to that is, well, I never consented to anything, right? I never signed any social contract. I didn't endorse the constitution. Uh, so if the, if the authority of the state is supposed to rest upon some actual act of consent and that actual act of consent never happened, then the state doesn't have any authority. And he even knocks down – I mean the one could say, well, if you vote, that act, that's an act of consent um, by the very act of participating in that. But he knocks that one down too and kind of calls out the absurdity of saying that you know, if you're one of – keeps using I mean, 50 millions of people. He says if you're one of these 50 millions and you, you happened to vote for something, it's, it's absurd to think that you had a meaningful choice in the matter. 
Yeah, which is, I mean, it's a great argument. I mean, that's, I think, a, a, a perfectly good argument against a certain kind of social contract theory. But then, Travis, the argument that, that you brought up is, I, th I think, a third argument, which goes beyond the historical argument and says that, look, even if contrary to fact, we had <laughs> signed this social contract, um, it would be illegitimate and void because uh, the rights that we are supposed to have given up in that social contract are in fact inalienable, which means we can't, through an act of will, give those rights up. Uh, so it's it's null and void, and and uh, the, the the transfer of authority never goes through. Right. I mean, he says, in, in quoting him again in section seven, he says it is a natural impossibility for any man to make a binding contract that shall invest others with any right, whatever, of arbitrary, irresponsible dominion over him. So yeah, we just can't – and that's – and I think one of the interesting things is he then spends a large chunk of the essay after that showing how the state is irresponsible and arbitrary and how it's not bound. It, it doesn't even make a pretext to being bound by the rules that it's written down for itself um, and, and that most of the stuff that it then does – is in no way, shape or form related to what it claims to exist for, which is protecting our rights and enhancing the good of the individuals and the public good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, the the inalienability stuff is really interesting, I think, um, and, and in some ways a kind of underappreciated element in the libertarian intellectual tradition, especially by academic philosophers um, who are by and large familiar with libertarianism through the work of Robert Nozick, uh, his Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And in that book, uh, Nozick uh, comes out against the idea of inalienability and uh, says that, you know, look, if in a, in a, in a free society, if people want to sell themselves into slavery, then um, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so he endorses the idea of slavery contracts, which seems at first glance like you know that that ought to be what the libertarian position is, right? Like it's, if you have a right to something, um, whether it's a right to you know a property right in your car um, or a right in your own like a right to your kidney uh, or a right to free speech, um, we think that you know most of those rights, the right to your car and the right to your kidney, we think ought to be transferable. If you want to give those rights up to somebody else in exchange for money or services, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do that. So so why shouldn't we say the same thing about other rights? Why shouldn't we say you could sell your right to free speech or sell your right to um, live uh, an autonomous life of freedom right, by, by putting yourself into a slavery contract? But um, – and so that that got Nozick a lot of criticism from people like Sam Freeman, who kind of characterized libertarianism as a sort of new feudalism um, because of this this idea. But uh, but actually, I think the the mainstream view of the libertarian intellectual tradition is one which holds certain rights to be inalienable in the sense that you just you you cannot transfer them, you cannot legitimately transfer them to another person in exchange for any consideration. So you get that in Spooner. Um, you get that in Murray Rothbard quite explicitly uh, and you get that in a lot of the earlier uh, Catholic natural law theorists um, uh, from whom Rothbard kind of selectively uh, drew. But it's a puzzling idea. I mean it's, it's, it's a very common idea in the libertarian intellectual tradition but it's, it's quite puzzling as to why we would think it to be true. And Spooner never really gives us much of an argument here for why certain rights should be inalienable. It's just, it's just kind of an assertion. But isn't it – I mean isn't it in a sense even baked into our common law contract tradition that – so we don't, we don't allow what's called specific performance in breach of contract. Like if I you know, make a contract to build a house for Trevor and then I fail to do so, the courts aren't allowed to force me to build him a house. Well, that would right? be the court. The reason they can't do that is because then the third party of the state would be basically enslaving you. Right, but but there's but there's underlying it is this notion that you like you can pay the damages, but you can't be you can't be enslaved. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems like what I mean. That's awfully similar to this. It's not an you know I could. So it would be perfectly legitimate for me to say, look, I'm going to work a certain term of years for you, and if I decline. If I back out halfway through, I may have to pay you some damages or repay you a portion of what you've paid me. But 
no contract of any kind setting aside the issues of social contract or you know libertarian tradition would allow you to force me to continue to finish out my term. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. But it's not obvious why that should be the case, right? I mean, so you you because in a sense we're limiting by by saying that that's the case we're limiting your ability to enter into certain kinds of contracts right we're saying you can't do this even if you really really want to even if it would be mutually beneficial even if it's an authentic expression of your autonomous will and so forth and it's not clear why we should do that right you think like okay well look you you make a contract to do something for me and then you decide you don't want to do it if uh, if we allowed you know, the specific performance, um, then that would involve forcing you to do this thing that you don't want to do. You really don't want to mow my lawn anymore. Uh, and we think, ah, there's something, there's something yucky about the state forcing you to do something you don't want to do. But the state's going to force you to do something you don't want to do anyways, right? It's going to force you to give me money. You don't want to give me money for, for damages for, uh, for violating your, con- uh, your contract. But we don't think that's bad. So why is it OK for the state to force you to do that but not for it to force you to do the thing that you said you didn't want to do? Um, there, I mean there might be a good – Argument for that, I'm not. I'm not coming down one way or another on the side of inalienability, but it's, um, it's, it's tricky. It's a difficult issue, and it's, um, I think, a little, uh, a little under theorized in a lot of the people who uh, who endorse it. Aaron had asked the question with, with uh, we talked about Spooner's concern of basically giving anything up to the state and what happens in those situations. And this is another thing of whether or not uh, I always wonder if this is the kind of argument that we should. Because he has a basically – he has an argument throughout that give him an inch, they'll take a mile or, or maybe it's give him an inch and there's nothing after that that precludes them from taking a mile, uh, which seems like a, a, a slippery slope argument. I mean, there's well-known problems with slippery slope arguments. They're never exactly inevitable. Um, and that's a historical question and he says that in section 8. He says, to say as the advocates of our government do that a man must give up some of his natural rights to a government in order to have the rest of them protected, the government being all the while the sole and irresponsible judge as to what rights he does give up and what he retains and what are to be protected, is to say that he gives up all the rights that the government chooses at any time to assume that he has given up and that he retains none and is to be protected in none except such as the government shall at all times see fit to protect and to permit him to retain. Is this going too far? I mean, this doesn't seem to be the actual historical case of government. I mean, there's some governments that take all your rights, and he kind of goes back and says that governments can't take all your rights because they need to suck you dry as a taxpayer and a soldier. But I mean, is, is he going too far? Is that well, it? but he he then spends quite a while arguing that the government basically has taken all your rights. I mean, he later, like in in section twelve, he has he goes to I think five different ways that the government systematically denies our most important rights. So I think I mean I don't think that he. My sense is he's not saying like we've given them an inch. It's we they've already taken everything there is. You just maybe don't recognize it yet. Yeah, I, I'm a kind of moderate <laughs> uh, libertarian, but uh, but I actually liked this argument. I thought it I thought it was pretty good because uh, the way I read it is is not that not that government has necessarily. Taken all the rights, right? This, we, don't, we don't live under a despotism uh, in the United States now. Or, or then. I mean, I'm, I mean, after reading Spooner, I'm not sure we we do or don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't even leaving post New Deal America. Yet. <laughs> there's a difference. No matter how unjust you think the government of the United States might be right now, there's a difference between the United States and North Korea. And I'm I'm glad I live in the former and not the latter. Uh, but but Spooner's point is, uh, look. So you you enter into this agreement with the United States uh, with the government. To, to give up some of your rights and you also give the power to the government to decide when a particular right that it wants to claim is one that you've actually given up or not. Well, if you've given the other party to your contract the absolute power to judge the terms of the contract, uh, then you've essentially given up all of your rights. And even if the other party doesn't actually take them, even if they're nice, right, and and they only uh, they only tax you a little bit or they only regulate you a little bit, the point is there's nothing really stopping them 
from going as far as they might like to go. And so if you retain any freedom at all, you retain it only at the discretion of the government. And so you're you're really in in what Republican political theorists would describe as a condition of servitude, right? Servitude doesn't mean necessarily that your master is ruling over you at every single moment telling you what to do and what not to do. It just means that you're it's always at your master's discretion to tell you what to do and what not to do. And so um, it, you can't count on that freedom. You can't claim it as a matter of right. And this has always struck me as one of the I mean, the, the arguments against social contract thinking for justifying the state's power or at least an argument for why even if we can't provide a strong reason for inalienability, we ought to think that inalienability should be present especially when we're talking about a social contract is that – I mean that the way that the government operates, its very nature, it's in any other contractual situation. If I you know, sign a contract with you to do something in exchange for money or whatever, one of the things that you can't do is then just change the terms of the contract down the road. Like we both have agreed to this thing and it's going to be enforced. Um, and what the state does, I mean, Spooner says they do it under the table all the time. They just ignore terms of the contract. But even officially, the state by the nature of lawmaking changes the terms of the contract all the time and I have no idea what that contract is going to look like in the future that even if I – let's say I did sign it, like I became a citizen and signed a social contract, I don't know what it's going to look like 20 years from now and voting if I'm one of 50 million people or one of 300 million people is not a meaningful way for me to have much say over that. And so that seems to push us towards this inalienability ought to be baked in just as a precaution given how totally weird the social contract is. Right, right. Yeah, I mean this becomes especially problematic when you start thinking about consent in terms of tacit consent, right? So the idea that you find in Locke where um, by by continuing to reside in a country after a certain age, uh, you thereby tacitly consent to well, what exactly? Right? What what are the terms to which you are agreeing, and what are the limits on those terms? If it's if it's tacit, right? If nobody is actually presenting the agreement to you and asking for your explicit consent, uh, it's very difficult to pin down with any precision what it is you're agreeing to and what rights you're reserving to yourself uh, and, and not explicitly not delegating to the government. I think that that we definitely have to get to. I think it's section eleven. That's page twenty three of the. The PDF that I, which I'm not sure is the same one. We'll put a link up on the show notes. But since it is election season, forever and ever and ever more, until the end of our days, <laughs> we have to definitely get to the part begins at the bottom of 22 where he lists all his favorite political pieces of political piffle. Um, and it, this is again, remember, this is to Grover, Grover Cleveland. And yet you have to face. You, and, let you, and yet you have the face to make no end of professions or pretenses that the impelling power, the real motive in all of this robbery and strife is nothing else than – and these are all now quotes – the service of the people, their interests, the promotion of their welfare, good government, government by the people, the popular will, the general wheel, the achievements of our national destiny, the benefits which our happy form of government can bestow. And it goes on and on and on and on. Hope and, and on. change and Hope making and America change great and, again. Exactly. And he says, sir, what is the use of such a deluge of unmeaning words unless it be to gloss over and if possible hide the true character of the acts of the government? Such generalities as these do not even glitter. They are only the stale phrases of the demagogue who wishes to appear to promise everything but commits himself to nothing. I think that pretty much says everything about what we're listening to right now in terms of presidential elections. But he, again, he has that special flair to – and I don't even know if all those come from Cleveland's speech. I don't know if he was just making them up. It wasn't clear. I couldn't find a copy of Cleveland's speech, but they probably did. But that gets into this, this section there of the, um, the meaning of the politicians, which he gets into some interesting public choice analysis about what the robbers do – uh, between each other. Yeah, there's a lot of anticipation of the sort of public choice idea that 
Um, polit politicians are no different from ordinary human beings. They have the same kind of motivations that uh, other human beings have. And uh, if, we, if we give them large amounts of power, we ought to expect that they will use that power in a way that will benefit themselves and uh, those to whom they're closely connected. That, that's another theme that just runs throughout um, uh, Spooner's work. So like on – I think this is section um, 9 – for instance, just one of the passages where Spooner uh, articulates this idea. He says, Sir, do you not know that in this conflict between these various diverse and competing interests, all ideas of individual rights, all ideas of equal and exact justice to all men will be cast to the winds, that the boldest, the strongest, the most fraudulent, the most rapacious and the most corrupt men will have control of the government and make it a mere instrument for plundering the great body of the people. I have that one double red highlighted. So yes, we, no, <laughs> one of quote. my favorites too. A good quote. <laughs> yeah, this idea of plunder uh, is a sort of common term um, throughout the 19th century really. You find this a lot in, uh, in Bastiat for example. Uh, talks about the idea of legal plunder in the law and, and, and in other essays. And um, it's, it's really a, a very public choice idea. I mean the idea of plunder is the idea of uh, using the power of the state to enrich yourself uh, at other people's expense. Um, and, uh, and these 19th century libertarians saw very clearly that, uh, that that's – despite all the flowery rhetoric about serving the common good, uh, that's what the state actually does when you put power in its hands. So far, we've only touched on the first portion of this very long essay. I mean after, after the sections that we've talked about, he goes on to spend quite a while talking about monetary policy and then quite a while talking about the obligations of contract. Um, and we encourage all of you to read the whole thing because it's terrific. And like Trevor said, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. But taken as a whole, I know you're a fan of this essay, but also you're skeptical of parts of it. So where do you think Spooner goes wrong? What arguments are not very convincing? Right. So I think if, first of all, for for readers picking up this essay for the for the first time, uh, the the really important sections are probably the first, I'd say, thirteen or so. If you read the th first thirteen sections, and they're all fairly short. Um, you'll get a very good sense of the, the major ideas uh, in Spooner's work. Uh, the, the stuff after that is interesting, but uh, but but of secondary importance. Um, as far as as where I think Spooner goes wrong, I mean, there are a lot of things that I disagree with Spooner about. Uh, so, for instance, um, I think you know I'm. I'm sort of ambivalent on the on the issue of intellectual property. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, first of all, what the right way of thinking about intellectual property rights is, whether one ought to take a kind of natural rights approach to it or whether that's the kind of thing that we just have to think about in purely kind of consequentialist terms. Um, but even if I buy into a natural rights analysis, I'm not sure that Spooner's analysis of it is, is quite the right one. Again, he's got a very strong position on intellectual property rights such that uh, if you create uh, an idea, um, you you come to own that idea in perpetuity, um, not just for the rest of your life, but you can actually bequeath it to your children, right? So that uh, on to the end of time, uh, you and your descendants will own the right to that uh, that book you wrote or the song you you hummed that one time. Um, <laughs> so we owe Spooner royalties after all of this. Yeah, that's until right. the heat death of the universe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think he's um, he's not entirely. Uh, plausible on intellectual property uh, and on property in general too. I think um, Spooner is probably more of a an absolutist than I would I, I think is warranted. Um, so Sp Spooner's um, Spooner's theory of, of property and like. Physical objects and land and, and, and artifacts and things like that is actually explicated in his essay on intellectual property. So uh, there's a good reason to read that essay, even if you don't care about intellectual property per se. And it's a broadly Lockean theory um, uh, of property, which which I think is is attractive in many respects. Um, but he he modifies the Lockean idea in, in a couple of important ways. Uh, first, he uh, he places much less emphasis on labor. Than Locke did. It's it's about discovery for Spooner rather than labor. So um, you don't necessarily have to work the land if you're just the first person to encounter it and put a fence around it. Then that's enough to get you title. And 
I think maybe that's a maybe that's a justifiable move. I think that that might be the labor mixing thing in Locke has is, is probably caused more problems than it's created than it's solved. Um, but the other move is to ditch the Lockean proviso quite explicitly. He rejects the idea that there's any proviso upon the appropriation of natural resources. And, and just to remind you, the, the Lockean proviso says that um, it's okay to appropriate resources for the common for your own private use. Right? You can you can put a fence around a plot of land, cut down a tree and make a house out of it and so forth, so long as you leave enough and is good for others. The idea being that, look, God gave the earth to mankind in common. It's here to support all of our lives. It's not just here to be your own little private dominion. So it's fine for you to support your own life with the fruits of the earth. After all, that's what it's there for. Um, but you have to allow other people to do the same thing. Um, and so, so the Lockean proviso plays this pretty important role in in limiting um, initial appropriation. Spooner rejects that, thinks there's no there's no proviso. So I think that's that's problematic. Um, you know, I'm I, I think there are good reasons to be troubled by the idea of property, even from a broadly libertarian perspective. Um, I, I think you know Herbert Spencer's discussion of property in the original edition of Social Statics, um, that I found to be a much more persuasive account. And Spencer is explicitly anti-Lockean in that essay. Um, you, you might think Spencer and Locke would be on, on roughly the same sides. But Spencer says, look, you know, first of all, uh, those of you who, who are living here in England in the, uh, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century who are appealing to Locke in order to justify your own property rights, that only works if the property rights that we have today actually came about through a process of peaceful labor mixing and exchange. And guess what? That's not how we got here, right? We got here through blood, conquest, and theft. And so even if Locke was right, that wouldn't do a darn thing to justify the rights we actually have because they didn't come about in the way that Locke said they had to come about. Second of all, um, the other problem and the deeper, more fundamental problem with the Lockean account is – when you enclose land, right, that, that was previously open to the commons, you're restricting the liberty of other people, right? You're saying like here's this piece of land that you used to be able to walk across and use however you want and now you can't do it anymore and if you try to, I'm going to shoot you, right? I'm going to use violence against you to stop you from using that land. That's something Spencer says that ought to be kind of troubling to a libertarian, especially if you think, well, like where's the end of this, right? Like what happens if all the property in the world is appropriated by private hands and so somebody who's born into it without any property now sort of exists at the will of the property-owning classes of mankind, right? It's like if you don't own any property, you can only stand on the surface of the earth if you get the consent of one of the property owners. And that looks like a kind of a condition of serfdom almost, um, which as libertarians we kind of ought to be uh, troubled by. Um, so – so I think – I mean that's – again, that's a problem. I don't know that it's an insurmountable problem. I'm not saying let's abolish property rights or anything like that. But I think that Spencer's analysis of, of property rights is, is a much more nuanced and sophisticated one um, than the, the kind that you get in, um, in Spooner. But on the other hand, uh, why should people read Spooner then? Or read, or read this essay at least, if nothing else. If Beyond they, if just they the totally if they fun rhetoric. Convinced, yes. Yeah. I, again, I can't underestimate just how much fun it is. I mean, like Aaron and I were talking earlier that we could we could easily spend the entire hour just reading juicy quotes from uh, from this essay. There's there's so much good stuff in here, and I have big stars written all over my uh, my copy of the text. So it's it's a lot of fun. Um, and again, I think it. Uh, there are ideas in here which um, contain at the very least important insights um, even if even if we don't want to follow Spooner as far as he goes with those ideas um, in in the kind of absolute strident way that that Spooner uh, wants to take them um, we, we must I think recognize that there's he's on to something. Um, and we need to think really carefully about what it is he's on to, what the implications are of, of what he's on to and then what the limitations are of what he's on to. So there's, there's some real important insights in here that I think express some, some deep, um, deep ideas uh, in the libertarian intellectual tradition. 
um, which even if at the end of the day you disagree with those ideas and you want to, you know, you're not a libertarian, you, you reject all this stuff, I think uh, this is just a really provocative, thought, thought-provoking piece that will get you to uh, think about, about government, about voting, about the nature of political power in a way that you probably wouldn't have done so had you not read this essay. So in that sense, it's a, it's a real educational experience. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.